the melodic ester synthesis and the acetoacetic ester synthesis. These are both examples of what we call a template synthesis, where they make a very similar product every time. So it turns out the melodic ester synthesis creates uh, a substituted acetic acid, if you will, uh, whereas the acetoacetic ester uh, makes a substituted acetone, or some version of a methyl ketone, as we'll see, is another way to describe it. Uh, and only thing that changes is you add a couple of key alkyl halides along the way in doing an SN2 reaction where they enolates the nucleophile that is going to then change uh, what groups are attached at the alpha carbon in the result. So, the, you know, the melonic ester synthesis can be looked at as a way of making carboxylic acids. So it's a, a new carboxylic acid synthesis. And the acetoacetic ester synthesis is a new way of making a methyl ketone. So it's a new ketone synthesis that's got to follow a certain pattern. So we'll also talk about beta decarboxylation in this uh, lesson, and we'll actually start with it because uh, it turns out both of these syntheses involve it, and it also has some biological relevance. So we'll bring that up first and then do an example of both of these template syntheses uh, to conclude the lesson. Now this lesson's part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you wanna be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so as I stated in the intro, we're gonna start with beta decarboxylation here. And in a beta decarboxylation reaction, we lose a carboxyl group, a carboxylic acid group, uh, and it's lost as carbon dioxide. So, and it turns out like, you know, if you exhale carbon dioxide, well, some of that carbon dioxide you exhale is produced in the citric acid cycle. If you recall, for every time you do that citric acid cycle, which you learned about in biology or biochemistry, you lose two CO2 molecules. Well, it turns out one of those two is lost by beta decarboxylation that we're about to study. Now it's enzyme mediated in that case, but it's still beta decarboxylation. It's specifically the step where we convert isocitrate into alpha ketoglutarate. All right, so in this case, it turns out that beta decarboxylation uh, is the result of certain carboxylic acids being unstable, and they're unstable when you have another carbonyl at the beta position. So if we look at this carboxylic acid here, there's his alpha carbon, there's his beta carbon, and there's a carbonyl there, and this is an unstable carboxylic acid when heat is applied. Now on the other side, however, this carboxylic acid alpha, beta, there's no carbonyl at that beta position, and we don't have this same lack of stability associated with this one uh, as we heat it. And so as a result, we're gonna lose this carboxylic acid group right here when we heat this up. But the carboxylic acid on the left-hand side of the molecule is still gonna be present. So we're gonna have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons left, but we are gonna lose that seventh carbon. So one, two, three, four, five, six, still gonna have a carbonyl where it used to be the beta position, so but we've lost this entire carboxyl group. It is left as carbon dioxide. Now you might be like, well, hey, Chad, what happened to that H? Glad you asked. So that H right there ends up in one way, shape, or form uh, on that alpha carbon right there. That alpha carbon just has two H's here, but it's a methyl group in the product. It picks up an H. So the question might be, well, what's so special about this beta position that it's the one we lose. Well, let's take a look. And this goes down to the kind of the idea that six membered rings are fairly stable and have very little ring strain. And if we look, if we just rotate our, our lovely single bond right here and rotate that around, we'll get this position right here. And we can see that this oxygen in one of these rotational conformations, this one specifically, ends up right next to the hydrogen of the carboxylic acid. And that's the key to this reaction. That only happens if that carbonyl group is beta, not if it's alpha, not if it's gamma or delta, only if it's beta and it's almost a quasi six membered ring. And so what happens here is we're gonna come and deprotonate that hydrogen. So with the oxygen using the pi electrons here. So we're gonna deprotonate that guy. So that frees up these electrons to come and form a pi bond over here. If you notice our carbon dioxide, the carbon has pi bonds, double bonds to two different oxygens. Well, we already have a double bond to one oxygen. Now we're making a double bond to the other one. But so that we don't violate this carbon's octet rule, this guy ends up over here. And we'll see the result here. So we've still got six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. So, but we have broken this bond entirely so that we can lose the CO2 over here. And so that's where our CO2 comes from. So, and then also notice that we formed an OH here and an alkene here. And if you notice, this guy right here is an enol. 
And that enol is simply going to tautomerize to the more stable keto form, your final product right here. And so that's kind of the general mechanism of beta decarboxylation going on here. And again, it's all related just to the sterics, or at least the, the spatial relationship uh, between a beta carbonyl oxygen and the hydrogen of the carboxylic acid. That's the key. Cool. So reason we're bringing this up is again, this is part of both the malonic ester synthesis and both part of the acetoacetic ester synthesis. And we, if we don't explain this first, both of those look pre like pretty magical reactions. Like there's some crazy hocus pocus going on, but now that you understand this, they'll make a lot more sense how they work. Let's take a look. All right, so we're going to look at the malonic ester synthesis and the acetoacetic ester synthesis in parallel because they're very similar. The sequence of, of reagents we add and stuff like that is nearly identical with just the variability being what do you want uh, that's variable on your final product. Now, they get their names from the original reactant. So this is malonic ester right here. Notice it's a diester and it's a beta diester. So, and this is acetoacetic ester right here. Notice it's not a beta diester. It is an ester, but it's also a ketone. So, but it is still a beta dicarbonyl. And that's going to be key here. They both have an alpha carbon that's alpha to two carbonyls. And so it's going to be exceptionally acidic. And so we can deprotonate sequentially both of these hydrogens only one at a time so but we can deprotonate it forming an enolate and that enolate is going to act as a strong nucleophile which can then go do sn2 with like a methyl or primary halide typically cool so way this works first got to add a strong base to deprotonate here and most commonly with esters you add the leaving group of your ester as the base just like we saw with the clasin and so in this case we'll use like so sodium or potassium ethoxide most commonly Cool. So notice our ester here, if we kind of generically work out the intermediates, is going to turn into an enolate, and then that enolate is going to come and attack an alkyl halide. And so in this case, I'm gen going to generically write R1 with a bromine, something along those lines. So that's just where we're going to start. And then he's going to come and do back to attack on R1 and kick off the bromine. And so your alpha carbon is going to replace one of these hydrogens with whatever that R1 group is. And again, it's best if it's methyl or primary. And so now all of a sudden, we are going to have attached to our alpha carbon R1, whatever it is. So, but then you can do this all over again. You can add another equivalent of sodium ethoxide followed by a second alkyl halide. Again, methyl primary is preferred. So, and you'll f take off the second alpha hydrogen forming an another enolate, which will then attack R2. And in the end, then you can attach a second alkyl group as well. And so you're always going to form this carboxylic acid. The question is, is what alkyl groups is your alpha carbon going to be attached to? Now, you don't actually have to replace both hydrogens with alkyl groups. You could just decide to do one. And if you only decide to do one, well, then you only have one alkyl group attached to your alpha carbon. But if you do decide to do two, you'll have two alkyl groups attached to your alpha carbon. Cool. Now, it turns out we're going to polish this off at the end with some hocus pocus, as we'll see that I kind of alluded to earlier, just by simply adding some H3O plus and we'll see what happens. All right, so instead of doing this generically though, I wanna do this specifically. So instead of just like generically having R1 and R2, let's add some specific groups. So let's just make the first one like a methyl halide, for instance. So that means in the final product that R, the thing we labeled R1 right here is now going to be a methyl group. So and the idea is again that you're going to deprotonate one of these hydrons initially to form an enolate and then that enolate is going to come and do backside attack and kick off the halogen and that's going to get you to If you now replace one of those alpha hydrons with the methyl group, okay, life is good. So then you're going to add sodium ethoxide again, and you'll have a chance to pull off the second H. Notice that H, it's still right here. So, but when you add sodium ethoxide again in step three, you're going to deprotonate that one and form an enolate yet again. So now we've got another enolate, and now we have a chance to add another alkyl halide. And so in this case, I'm going to get a little exotic here, and I'm going to add benzyl bromide instead. Just it'll be easy to recognize here. 
And we're just going to come in again and do backside attack. Kick off the bromine, just straight up SN2. And now we'll have ended up with, rather than redraw this, I'm just going to move this around a little bit. So we had that methyl group on one side, and now we've got the benzyl group on the other. And that means that R2 written right here is that benzyl group. Cool. So notice benzyl, it has seven carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, not just six. So it's not just a phenyl group, it's a benzyl group. Cool. But that actually turns out to be the final product. And so the question is, well, how do you get from here to this final product? Well, that's actually all, step five accomplishes all of that. So, and it turns out we should add some heat here as well, but it's just H3O plus and heat. That's all of step five. And, and that's all the magic here. Well, if we look here, we learned that esters just like any carboxylic acid derivative, when you add H3O plus, and especially H3O plus with heat, even more so, they all turn into carboxylic acids. And so the first thing that H3O plus is gonna do here is hydrolyze both esters to carboxylic acids. So let's start there. Not working the whole mechanism by any stretch, but I do want you to see the pattern. So now we've got two carboxylic acids instead. However, we're also heating this. And if you look, these two carboxylic acids are beta to each other. For this guy, alpha, beta. And for this guy, alpha, beta. They're beta to each other. And so for one of them, beta decarboxylation is going to take place. And it doesn't really matter which one you draw there. It's a symmetrical molecule and it's arbitrary. So I'm just going to choose the one on the left so we can line it up with, you know, our product here, but it doesn't really matter. So, but we're going to lose this guy here as carbon dioxide and our alpha carbon right there is still gonna be bonded to a methyl group and a benzyl group and still have a carboxylic acid on the other side. Once we've lost the one carboxyl group, the second carboxyl group is not gonna be lost. He's not beta to any other carbonyls at this point, things of this sort, so uh, perfectly stable. And so we just made a carboxylic acid. And again, the key was, what two alkyl, alkyl groups were attached at that alpha carbon. So sometimes we say that this makes substituted acetic acid molecules. So that's acetic acid, platyl acetic acid, and you could attach either one or two alkyl groups to it. If you only wanted to attach one, well, then you would just take off steps three and four and jump straight to H3O plus and heat after step two. So, but if you want to attach two, you have the option of attaching two. Now it turns out the acetoacetic ester synthesis is exactly analogous so, except that you've got this ketone on the other side. And so instead of forming uh, a carboxylic acid, you're going to form this methyl ketone always. And the key is on the alpha carbon on the other side, you have a, a chance of either having one or again, two alkyl groups attached, but it's actually the exact same sequence of steps. You've got a, a, an ethyl ester here. And so we're going to use sodium ethoxide once again as our strong base. In this case, I'm going to parallel it with what we did here. So I'm going to use methyl bromide in step two. That means that your first alkyl group attached is simply going to be a methyl group. Cool. And if we want to stop there, we could just add H3O plus and this guy would not exist. That'd just be another hydrogen still. But if we want to add another alkyl group, we can. We just got to add another equivalent of sodium ethoxide. And once again, I'm going to use phenyl, I'm sorry, benzyl bromide. which means that R2 in the final result is once again a benzyl group. Oop, that's really horrible looking. Cool, better. Sweet, and then finally this one, same thing. You've got to finish it off with H3O plus and heat. And so by the time you've done the first four steps, You've replaced one of these hydrogens first with the methyl group, and then you're replacing the other hydrogen, so of the alpha hydrogens, with this lovely benzyl group. Cool, and then when you add the H3O plus and heat, first thing again happens. So nothing's gonna happen with our ketone, but we still have an ester over here, and so the first thing that's gonna happen is that ester is gonna get hydrolyzed to a carboxylic acid, just like we did above. And this carboxylic acid 
So alpha beta has a beta carbonyl group. And so it's not going to be heat stable. And so as it's heated, that is going to be lost. That carboxyl group is going to be lost as carbon dioxide. And you see what you're left with? We're just left with a methyl ketone on this side and then the alpha carbon bond into a methyl group and a benzyl group. And that is your synthesis. So cool. When you're looking at syntheses uh, from a retrosynthesis perspective, you've got a new way to create a carboxylic acid now, and you've got a new way to create a methyl ketone. And so when you're looking at a retrosynthesis problem, you're like, oh, that's a carboxylic acid. I have a new way to do that. You know a lot of old ways from, from the last chapter as well, but you've got a new way to do it now as well, which is much more likely to see in this chapter. So, and then if you're making a methyl ketone, dead giveaway, you're probably doing the acetoacetic ester synthesis as part of that retrosynthesis problem. Cool, if you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best thing you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for practice problems on alpha substitution reactions, if you're looking for the study guide that goes to this lesson, if you're looking for my brand new OCHEM 2 final exam rapid review, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.